Déjenle escribo a ustedes a ver si tiene problemas para conectarse.
No, les voy adelantando que hoy, hoy a la una tenemos eh, un, un seminario de Yamir Moreno. Él es eh, investigador de la Universidad de Zaragoza y pues también ha sido presidente de la Sociedad de Sistemas Complejos y de la Sociedad de Ciencia de Redes. Y, y pues va a platicar sobre lo que ha estado haciendo con colegas de distintos países eh, sobre modelado de epidemias. Entonces, eh, pues si se quieren unir, puede ser por aquí mismo en Zoom, digamos el, el mismo salón, o también lo pueden seguir en YouTube, en el canal del C3. Entonces sería al, a la una y después eh, pues habría hora social con colegas del C3. Eh, habíamos planeado que los últimos viernes de cada mes hubiera una comida con plática. Eh, pero por la cuarentena cada quien tendrá que comer en, en su casa. Y, y bueno, también los invito el sábado a las dos veinte horas de Nueva York, entonces es. Eh, pero es a la, a la 1 y 20 horas de México. Eh, voy a participar en, en, este, en este evento en línea. Eh, también se pueden registrar. Eh, vamos a hablar sobre gobernanza, tratando de pandemias. Y pues es con Yanir Barjan con quien estuve durante una estancia postdoctoral en el Instituto de Sistemas Complejos de Nueva Inglaterra y pues en los últimos meses he estado muy activo eh, pues juntando datos, informando sobre cómo frenar la pandemia. De hecho, todo eso se une en este sitio que les voy a compartir en coronavirus.org que tiene muchísima información, eh, se actualiza diariamente y también eh, pues requieren voluntarios, entonces si alguien eh, quiere colaborar, pues tienen ya cientos de voluntarios, puede ser con modelado, con programación, con, con traducción, eh, tienen, tienen distintos mensajes. Y pues lo que vamos a lo que vamos a platicar de gobernanza, pues probablemente comparemos eh, distintos, distintas acciones que se han tomado, cuáles han sido efectivas, cuáles no. Y también yo creo que hablaremos de por qué distintas personas o, o líderes han tomado decisiones equivocadas. El sábado a las 2, perdón. Eh, a la 1 y 20 hora de México. En esta liga de Startup Societies eh, tiene... De, de hecho es un evento de dos días, eh, mañana y pasado. Entonces, sí, probablemente haya otras cosas que también les puedan interesar. ¿Y eso es a través de la página de coronavirus? No, de la primera. Startupsocieties.org, de una virtual summit. Uh, ¿Pasó la liga por el chat? Sí. Ah, perdón. Solo a Ahorita sí les... Ahora sí. Ah, ok. Perfecto. Gracias. Sí, entonces, la, la primera es del, de la conferencia y la segunda del proyecto. Eh, con información... 
que, digamos, trae información hasta qué hacer si alguien en tu casa está infectado, hasta si eres un presidente y quieres tomar decisiones que, <ríe> que, que es lo que sí sirve y qué es lo que no. O cómo hacer eh, mascarillas en casa y cosas así. Igual deberían de ser como una versión para Latinoamérica, ¿no? De la de en coronavirus. Porque yo me acuerdo que cuando lo leí, te decían así como tips de agarra un Uber para en vez, si tienes que salir, ¿no? O renta un carro o cosas así. Pero digo, no, no es mala onda, pero aquí no, eso no aplica, ¿no? no, no casi nadie <risa> tiene el dinero como para rentar un carro. Sí. Sí. Um... Sí, digamos aquí como que estamos ignorando cosas que no se pueden hacer, pero bueno, no sé, también ayer eh, en Twitter compartí un artículo de Tomás Puello, eh, que ya tiene varios donde también pues analizan lo que han hecho otros países para los que han podido controlar la epidemia y los que no o al, no sé, por ejemplo, Singapur primero fue bien y luego fue mal. Eh, entonces, pues ex, explica eh, exp, explica por qué en países como Taiwán sí la han controlado muy bien y en Singapur se les escapó. Entonces, esto se los comparto aquí. Y y entonces, hay, hay medidas que, que pues no estamos en condiciones de implementar en México y en otros países, pues hasta a nivel legal, ¿no? En Corea del Sur, después de la epidemia que tuvieron de MERS en 2015, pasaron leyes para que si había otra epidemia, el gobierno pudiera seguir los teléfonos celulares de todos los ciudadanos que... No sé, en China eso lo hacen sin, <ríe> sin epidemia, ¿no? Entonces en China también lo, lo han hecho. Eh, pero pues en México no, y en casi todos los países no se puede hacer, ¿no? Digamos, eh, necesitan de estas leyes terroristas para poder hacer eso, ¿no? Eh, ¿No, ¿no me escuchan? Sí, sí, se escucha. Ok. Eh, entonces, digo, desde que se empezaron a anunciar distintas medidas del gobierno, pues muchos decíamos, oigan, pero pues hagan más estudios, ¿no? Eh, pues este modelo Sentinel está muy bien para influenza, pero será suficiente para coronavirus. Hay que detectar muchos más casos y aislarlos que se queden en sus casas o en lugares, eh, no sé, en acondicionar hoteles para que la gente esté de cuarentena ahí, eh, aunque no sean graves, para, para controlar. Y pues desde el principio el gobierno dijo, oigan, ¿saben qué? Nosotros no vamos a poder detener la epidemia, como sí lo lograron en Nueva Zelanda, Taiwán, eh, Tailandia sino que vamos a, a tratar de aplanar la curva y retrasar eh, las infecciones de manera tal que, que no haya eh, saturación en hospitales. Y eso es más o menos lo que han estado haciendo y pues ser un poco claro el por qué, en el sentido de que 
eh, pues millones de pesos en, en más pruebas y pues digamos tuviéramos mejores datos sobre cuántos casos hay. El gobierno no tiene los medios para, para darle seguimiento a, a todos los casos que potencialmente tienen una infección, aunque, aunque los detectaron, no habría manera de decirle a todos los que tuvieron contactos con ellos, quédate en tu casa y asegurarse que se queden en su casa. Eh, digo, si tenemos problemas de seguridad con el crimen organizado, ahora imagínense, digamos, no, no tenemos los mecanismos para asegurarse de eso. Leía en este artículo de de Puello, es la, la, la última liga que, que les compartí, que en Taiwán, pues, eh, te están monitoreando tu celular y entonces si debes de estar en cuarentena en tu casa, pues te detectan si te sales de tu casa y te multan como 10 mil dólares. Y si apagas tu celular o se le acaba la pila, eh, al ratito ya está la policía tocando a tu puerta <ríe> para checar si todo está bien. Eh, entonces, pues, pues nosotros no podemos hacer eso, ¿no? Eh, a pesar de que un buen porcentaje de la población sí tiene teléfonos inteligentes, eh, pues no tenemos manera de, de empezar a, a hacer seguimiento de todos los casos eh, potenciales. Entonces, pues como no iba a ser tan útil la información de exactamente quién tenía y quién no tenía, pues se enfocaron más en eh, pues aumentar la capacidad de los hospitales y pues aunque algunos hospitales de manera puntual sí se han saturado, eh, pues todavía hay capacidad disponible. En un par de semanas se verá si esta se sobrepasa o no. Eh, digamos, Hace dos semanas, como estaba creciendo, eh, pues esperaba que para hoy tuviéramos como 20 mil casos. Pues no sé, ahorita, ayer anunciaron 17,799. Entonces, con los que anuncian hoy, pues estaríamos entre 18 y 19 mil, lo cual pues quiere decir que ha seguido aumentándose a la, a la misma tasa, que es más o menos se duplica el número de casos cada, cada semana. Entonces, si tenemos 20.000 esta semana, pues 40.000 la próxima semana, 80.000 en dos semanas, eh, 160.000 en tres semanas, y a fines de mayo 320.000 confirmados. Eh, si ese fuese el caso, pues multiplíquenlo por 8, tendríamos como 2 millones y medio de casos y, pues no sé, como 100.000 hospitalizaciones. Y pues eso no, no lo aguantaría. Y entonces lo que se espera, lo que el gobierno espera, y, y pues yo creo que todos esperamos para evitar ese escenario, es que pues en las próximas dos semanas se empiece a estabilizar el número de casos nuevos, que deje de aumentar, como ha estado aumentando, y eventualmente hacia fines de mayo ya empiece a bajar. Entonces si logramos eso, pues no se va a saturar el sistema hospital, hospitalario. De hecho, a pesar de que tenemos eh, casi 18 mil casos, eh, ahorita casos activos tenemos creo que 4 mil, porque ya se han recuperado como 11 mil 500 más 1,732 que se han muerto. Entonces, pues de esos 17 mil 800, más de 13 mil ya están... Eh, digamos, ya no están infectados ya sea que se recuperaron o no se murieron eh, el 13% se han muerto y, y entonces pues no hay tantos casos y en hospitales pues creo que andaba por ahí de la tercera parte entonces no sé poco más de mil personas en el, en hospitalizadas en este momento y pues más o menos parece que como que se podría empezar a estabilizar aunque hay oscilaciones pues podría ser wishful thinking y, y pues digamos, en, en dos semanas podremos ver mejor si, si, si se reduce o no.
Oigan, pues es, no, no da luces de, de vida. Eh, estoy en California, entonces son dos horas más temprano. No sé si sea demasiado temprano para él, pero pues ayer me escribió pidiendo los datos del Zoom, entonces no, no sé. Pues si quieren les voy adelantando un poco de lo que platicaríamos el sábado <ríe> y se ahorran cinco dólares. Eh, digamos, creo, creo que algo, algo que, que ha quedado claro con la epidemia, bueno, con la pandemia, es que eh, pues la complejidad nos está desbordando. Digamos, ya mucha gente había notado que en nuestra historia, pues la complejidad ha ido en aumento, eh, pues desde el origen del universo, pero también en nuestra especie, pues cada vez somos más complejos y pues ha habido una aceleración de desarrollos tecnológicos, eh, pues están estas leyes de tipo Moore donde hay crecimiento exponencial en distintas cosas, que no quiere decir que no vaya a haber saturaciones como ya se ha saturado la, se empieza a saturar la, la, la ley de Moore, eh, pero es notable el, el incremento en complejidad que ha habido en nuestras sociedades digamos, al estar mucho más conectados pues eso aumenta la complejidad porque lo que una persona dice o hace puede afectar a muchas más personas de lo que nunca había sucedido ¿no? entonces esto no es simplemente que un tweet se vuelva viral sino pues también el, el caso de la paciente 31 en Corea del Sur, que pues a, tenían controlado la epidemia hasta que esta paciente eh, pues fue una super propagadora y, y de ahí pues hubo miles de casos que, que pues, tu, les costó mucho trabajo poder controlar. Entonces, eh, pues esta complejidad, como hemos visto, al tener muchas interacciones se produce información nueva que limita qué tanto podemos predecir. Eh, al tener esta información nueva constantemente, pues eso implica cambio constante y tal vez eh, cambios cada vez más rápido. Y pues las organizaciones, las estructuras organizacionales que habíamos usado o que hemos estado usando, cada vez son menos adecuadas para lidiar con este tipo de situaciones. Entonces, eh, ahorita tenemos una situación global, es un problema global, nos afecta a todos, y vemos que es difícil que la gente se ponga de acuerdo sobre qué hacer, no solo entre países, sino dentro de los mismos países, cada país ha tomado distintas medidas, luego las cambian, o sea, el Reino Unido, Suecia, que, que no hicieron... Eh, cuarentena en México tenemos una cuarentena light en el sentido que otras ciudades como Bogotá, Lima Santiago China, nadie sale de las casas eh, digamos aquí nada más se recomienda que, que no se salga pero pues digamos mucha gente está afuera ¿no? eh, entonces por un lado Distintas personas toman distintas decisiones, tienen distintos puntos de vista y en principio para, bueno, si nos pudiéramos coordinar, si nos pudiéramos haber coordinado eh, de manera global desde el principio, pues esto no debería de haber salido de China. Pero como salió y en los países a los que llegó primero que pues fueron Italia, España, Irán, eh, Estados Unidos pues bueno eh, principalmente ¿no? porque otros países a donde llegó pues sí pudieron frenarlo pero 
los pocos países pues no tomaron las medidas lo suficientemente rápido, pues de ahí se propagó el resto del mundo, entonces ya se volvió pandemia. Eh, entonces, creo que muestra bastante bien las deficiencias de nuestras organizaciones a nivel global, pero también a nivel país, a nivel regional. Eh, no sé, pongo el caso de Brasil y de Estados Unidos y pues el de México creo que también es un poco obvio, pero en Estados Unidos, pues también en Brasil, pues el presidente, pues como que él, al principio decía, no, pues no, no hay problema y les dejó la responsabilidad a los gobernadores que cada quien hiciera lo que, lo que considerara mejor, ¿no? Que consiguiera sus propios... Eh, pruebas, sus propios eh, medicamentos y pues hubo cierto apoyo federal, pero no, no mucho. Eh, en Brasil fue peor porque Bolsonaro no quería hacer nada, decía no, pues que se muera quien se muera, pero Brasil no se detiene y ahí fueron los gobernadores que dijeron, oye, no, tenemos que, que entrar en cuarentena, si no va a ser una catástrofe todavía mayor. Y pues distintos gobernadores han estado tomando distintas medidas y de hecho el crimen organizado también ha estado tomando medidas que uno podría decir que son más sensatas que las que ha tomado el presidente. Y, y pues en Estados Unidos al dejarlo a, a los estados, pues hay estados que han tomado medidas más, eh, pues no sé si llamarlo extremas, eh, de confinamiento y, y pues digamos han podido más o menos controlar eh, la epidemia y otros que han sido mucho más relajados por distintos motivos. Y esta semana, pues, hay el, el riesgo de que, por ejemplo, Georgia y Texas eh, ya se están eh, levantando las cuarentenas. Eh, no, no totalmente, pero, eh, digo, creo que no va a haber ya to todavía eventos masivos, pero sí hay, eh, no sé si congregaciones en las iglesias, pero sí creo que ya abrieron las peluquerías y, y salones de boliche y cosas así. Y así como que, bueno, no sé, eh, me imagino que se deberían andar de desinfectando las bolas de boliche cada, cada vez que la toman, ¿no? no sé cómo la van a hacer, pero bueno. El, el problema es que el riesgo de que haya nuevos brotes o de que vuelva a incrementar, porque de hecho en Georgia todavía ni siquiera empiezan a reducir el número de, de casos, todavía están aumentando como en México. Entonces es como si, si dijeran ahora, ah, pues saben que ya regresamos a clases, todos regresan a trabajar y, y así como que oigan, pero, pero todavía ni siquiera nos estabilizamos. Entonces el, el riesgo de que eh, se incremente la velocidad de propagación en Georgia es, es elevado. Y como casi no hay restricciones de viaje entre los estados de Estados Unidos, pues todos los esfuerzos que están haciendo pues, en Nueva York, en California, en Illinois y, de, y demás, eh, pues se pueden ir a la basura porque la gente que llegue de otros estados, pues muy probablemente va, va a estar eh, llegando con, con infecciones. ¿no? Entonces... Eh, Digamos, creo, creo que es claro que la democracia como la conocemos, eh, pues ya no está funcionando. Y entonces eso lo vemos con distintos ejemplos por motivos distintos. Digamos, el caso de Trump es uno, eh, en el Reino Unido con su Brexit es, es otro, en México pues también tenemos problemas severos que las decisiones muchas decisiones se acaben tomando solo por una persona y pues ya lo habíamos visto por la, cuando estábamos platicando de la ley de la variedad requerida de Ashby que no es factible que una persona por más brillante que sea o un grupo de personas por más brillantes que sean simplemente si su variedad eh, no es tan amplia como la variedad de lo que están tratando de controlar que pues en este caso son países o o estados o, o ciudades, 
pues simplemente no van a poder controlarla y pues al no poder diferenciar todas las situaciones posibles que un sistema puede estar, eh, pues tarde o temprano se van a equivocar. Y es lo que, lo que está pasando constantemente. Y no es necesario que la gente, pues no sé, tenga algún problema en particular o mala fe o algo así. Simplemente es nuestra, nuestras limitaciones cognitivas. Eh, digamos, somos finitos en el número de situaciones que podemos diferenciar y eso pues también limita nuestra... ¿Qué, qué, qué tantas decisiones correctas vamos a poder tomar en, en un entorno complejo? Eh, entonces, pues a, a final de cuentas, cuando la complejidad es mucho mayor, al, de nuestro entorno es mucho mayor a la, a la nuestra, pues es casi casi como estar echando volados, ¿no? porque no, no sabemos si lo que hacemos va a impactar a largo plazo de manera positiva o negativa. Digo, es, ya es exagerando y un caso extremo, pero eh, así es. Y, y bueno, el... A pesar de que estamos viendo de que la democracia como la conocemos, pues está fallando, y pues de, de hecho esto ya se ha, ha mencionado en distintos países desde hace años por distintos motivos, pues esto no implica que, ah, pues ahora queremos un autoritarismo, porque sería todavía peor, digamos, la, la variedad de un sistema autoritario, eh, como lo vimos con la Unión Soviética, pues es todavía menor a la de... Oh, ahí está Cés. Bueno, luego le seguimos. Ahí se es. Uh, uh, Carlos, um, I'm calling you from my car. Ya. Yeah. Um, min minutes before the, the call, my, uh, I lost all signal. <laughs> It's very embarrassing and I, and I, and I apologize. Um, there's, uh, is your class an hour? Is there 15 minutes left? Uh, hour and a half, so we have 45 minutes. Okay, well, I'm sorry to interrupt. You're in the middle of, uh, of talking. How would you like to handle this? Oh, if if you want to 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 start, are you comfortable in your car? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, on, no, I got, I got, I got, I got, I drove to the nearest Wi-Fi. Uh, okay, you know, let me turn it off to kill the engine noise. Okay, uh, good. It doesn't um, come through, so so we we hear you fine. So oh, great, great, great. Okay. Um, no, I'm actually, I have everything. Um, here is, I share? Okay. Um, Well, uh, thank you for having me. I, I, I apologize for keeping you. Um, no problem. Uh, well, l l let me introduce you. Uh, okay, I, okay. I met I met Seth uh, at Nexi when I was a uh, doctoral fellow, and uh, Seth did a PhD in cognitive science in Indiana University in Bloomington, and he he went to Walt Disney, not to That's do right. cartoons but to do research, and he's now a professor in. University of California in Davis. Um, yep. So. Uh, can Can you tell me? Uh, actually, I don't know the audience. Who's this class and and and, and background and level? It would help yeah. me a little bit to adjust. Yeah, it's uh, mainly master students uh, of different programs. So you have computer scientists and physicists and artists and economists and doctors. So that that kind thing. of interdisciplinarity uh, is is why I do this. That's why Carlos does it. Um, I love having all these different audiences uh, in the in the room, and uh, and I um, that helps a lot. I can really adjust based on that. So uh, as Carlos says, my background is in complex systems and cognitive science, um, and I, I've become more and more interested in how can how can big data big data on the internet help us understand really big questions about democracy, self-governance, um, and the self-organization of, of institutions. 
please. Um, I've, in this work, I've been heavily influenced by a woman named Eleanor Ostrom. You should look her up. She's the first woman to win the Nobel Prize in economics. And she did it for her work. We have a very simplistic, uh, complex systems has been slow to invade political science. We still have very simplistic notions of, of um, of what works uh, politically. And there's a lot of ideology influencing that, of course. So, um, so in economics, you still have this sort of current view that, well, there's two options. There's, there's the state, you know, which is dictatorship, or there's markets, which is freedom. Uh, and Eleanor Ostrom's contribution um, to economics has been to challenge that dichotomy to break it down by studying small communities who self-govern. And, and that's really my mission, um, uh, but I've tried to take it in this kind of new direction that lets us bring a lot more data to it. So I wanna understand the process specifically of learning to self-govern and the predictors of success in the communities, the amateurs, the everyday people run. And this is important actually. So we have these very classic theories of democracy. Every, every, every person who's put on a philosopher hat and said, I'm gonna tell the world something about democracy by thinking has, has said that um, in order to have a healthy large scale democracy, you need citizens with daily on the ground experience in participation. So um, if you or maybe your parents are involved in community group or church, church group, they're involved in leadership, they have to go to meetings where there's minutes and they have to raise their hand and they've learned, I don't know, do you guys have Robert's rules? Um, and anything like this, the small scale, uh, really like running a book club or running a, uh, you see these a lot in rural communities, um, rural farmer cooperatives that have meetings to run things together. That it's, it's been a theory for, um, boy, at least hundreds of years that, um, that to protect a large scale democracy from devolving into, into um, autocracy, into monarchy and oligarchy, um, you need responsible citizens, citizens who are savvy to the ways that governance can fail, that democracy can fail, um, who are savvy to what a demagogue looks like, and that people acquire this experience through local participatory practice. Now, a lot of the story of the second half of the 20th century was the, the degradation of these skills and talents. Um, there's a very classic book, it's called Bowling Alone, and it talks about, you know, the Americans, uh, uh, at least, used to engage in all kinds of clubs, including bowling clubs. They, they were involved in meetings. Garden clubs are really well run, um, but that with TV, people stopped engaging in this sort of civic, small-scale civic engagement, and these skills have deteriorated, and American democracy, at least, has, has, um, has declined as a result. Um, uh, so, and then what can the internet do? Well, the, the news recently, at least, about how the, the, the internet contributes to democracy is all bad news. <laughs> it's feeling really grim. All this stuff about Facebook and so on. Um, but I'm, I'm still you know, a believer a little bit. There was this dream that the internet would empower everybody. And, um, and I still kind of think, you know, there's room for that. So I've looked at, wondering, you know, are online communities, the communities you engage in, uh, can those be, can this provide the kinds of skills that we need democracy to be able to provide? Um, I want to pause here. I would actually love to hear from anybody um, listening, if they or maybe their family have experienced this kind of local civic practice I'm talking about. In Mexico, we do have uh, like neighborhood committees. I I don't know. So throughout the country, has participated. Or is that like an uh, urban thing? I'm not sure. I'm sure in Mexico City, in every uh, district, there are several, uh, and they have let's say a direct connection with the representatives. Uh, but I, I I don't know about the rest of the country. I, I don't know if, if someone else knows. Uh, in my case, I can tell you that in my habitational unit, they also do these kinds of assemblies where people discuss the topics of the unit and they vote about it. 
also in the faculties they have like like this kind of mechanism but like i think that's most of the mechanisms i can tell because there are other mechanisms that are bigger but i i have not been in in those yeah uh, the it's actually the bigger mechanisms that are more studied by scientists and so we ignore a lot of these small small you know five people in a room type things and i, I want to shed light on those um so uh so i've actually used video games to do it um i study world of warcraft i study minecraft um i have some work on sports uh, nba basketball uh what uh poker um the game of go it's like uh, um east asian chess uh so why why what makes video games useful for doing science in this type of system um they're they're for me, they're this perfect mix between the, what's powerful about the laboratory, about uh, um, laboratory experiments, which is that you can learn about causation, but they're also, uh, but the downside of the experiment is they're often artificial. They're, they're not real people or real motivations. They're kind of fake. Um, on the other hand, you have uh, observational data, you know, scraping Twitter. Uh, and that's powerful because it's real people do, uh, addressing real issues and doing things that's important to them. But you lose all causation. You can study the data all you want. You will never be able to tell if A caused B or B caused A. Uh, video games and other engineered social systems are in this sweet spot. They're this highly simplified environment with clear goals, high motivation, but it's real people. Um, and more importantly, uh, video games often there's many instances of the same game on different servers and they have their own cultural evolutionary processes proceeding and so what you get is um where if i want to study humans um i should bring a thousand individuals into the lab and study them but if i want to study self-governance i need to bring a thousand societies into the lab my n isn't the, the the million individuals who visited all those all these servers or, or communities my n is the thousand communities they've they've joined to really do proper science at the societal unit of analysis so um uh with engineered social systems i have oh i have also a lot of data. I've data on the whole lifespan of the system. I can see when it was born, when it died. I can see everything that happened by every individual at that scale. I can watch in incremental change happen. And because they're smaller, they're more tractable in a way. They're more scientifically studyable because they're, they're basically simpler. Um, and so for this reason, I think uh, video games can be taken seriously. Um, uh, because people take them seriously. People spend time in online communities. Um, and if they think it's important and, and, and worth governing around, then it's worth uh, uh, me, it's worth scientists to pay attention to. So that's what we're going to do. I'm going to perform a large scale comparative analysis of resource governance institutions. And I want to ask, what are the success and failure rates of, of these sort of everyday um, resource systems. What factors predict success? How do these? Um, uh, how do those factors change if I'm looking at small communities versus large communities? Actually, I also want to pause here and make sure a I'm coming through clearly. B I'm not talking too quickly. I was wondering maybe somebody could put a, a, a type in the chat. You know, speed up or slow down just right. Just right. Okay. Thank you. So this is why we're going to look at at, uh, at the at the game of Minecraft. Um. Uh. So I don't know. Uh. You has anyone played the game? You yeah, anyone know what I'm talking about here? No, uh, it was very, po it's still a popular game for, for young groups. Um, I, I still love to play it. Uh, it really hit its peak in 2009 and it became one of the most popular games, uh, video games ever. Now what's, this is a, this is a screenshot of it. It creates this beautiful literal virtual world. It's infinite in every direction. Um, and what happens, you tend to have a lot of people interacting on it, building stuff. 
you can see up in the corner the structure is being built and then, but there's one boss and uh, these people together can build beautiful things like inspiring constructions this is a scale model of the starship enterprise um, it's a lot of nerds playing and but they built it block by block and that's exciting and impressive even if it's fake um and an, another interesting thing about it is on the left here we have actual deforestation in mangrove forests in Indonesia on the right we have deforestation in Minecraft so there's finite there's there's resources in the world and they're not exactly finite but they have to be managed uh, trees go up uh, go down buildings go up um, but if no one replants trees then it's harder for future people to get resources so uh, managing that is a challenge that communities have to solve uh, and in, that's not the only one they have to solve. A really big problem is literally running out, having a computer strong enough to have enough RAM, CPU, and bandwidth uh, that it doesn't choke if too many people join. And if there's one bad actor uh, um, spreading too many fires or growing too many sheep in the game, it sounds ridiculous, but this can make a server crawl to a halt. Everyone gets kicked off. That's a bad experience for players and players will leave your community. They're very picky about this. So if you run a community, you have to, you have to manage real world resources, including getting your server paid for. You have to solicit in-game contributions to build cool stuff. You have to retain quality players because you're competing with other communities for players. And of course you have to manage bad behavior. These are all what I'm gonna call resource governance problems that have to be solved outside the game before you can have fun in the game. And we're gonna to attend to all the tricks people do to manage these resources. That's important work because it's a microcosm of all the resource management and collective action challenges that face any kind of online activity. In fact, it's a microcosm of the, um, uh, of the challenges that face you, uh, that face the earth. These are the biggest challenges facing humanity, um, four of them. And they have something special, important in common. Theoretically, they're all instances of the tragedy of the commons, which is the biggest challenge facing the globe, facing global humanity. And the challenges in Minecraft, it's not real trees, it's not necessarily real resources, but um, lo the, the logical structure is identical. Uh, in every case you have, um, the, these are all miniature tragedies of the commons and experience solving them could scale. So uh, I lost a slide here. Ah, here's a slide. This is a, the reason individuals have to solve these problems is Minecraft is not like a typical game. Here's a typical game. Those dots are all people um, and the red box is everyone joining computers run by a company. What makes Minecraft special is it looks instead like this. The, the, you had to buy the game, but the server for the game was provided for free, the server software. Anybody could install it and create their own instance of the game. And so there was this sort of federated, wildly decentralized model where anybody could join any community, anybody could create any community and you have actual competition between communities for players. This contributed largely to the success of this of the game is that it was really driven by players in this unusual way, which gets us to the human scientist's dream. Um, imagine that history wasn't an N of one science, right? That we had multiple instances of the earth and we could replay history thousands of times with small modifications. I wanna take the earth, double it, change one thing. If we could do this, then uh, history would literally become an experimental science. All the classic philosophical questions about humanity, man's inhumanity to man, these would become questions we could answer with laboratory experiments. Now that's ridiculous <laughs> and it's impossible, but with this sort of structure, we start to get there. We start to get the society as the basic, as the smallest unit of analysis in large scale comparative science. 
Uh, and this is what Minecraft has to bring us. Forget the game. Forget the fact that it is a game. Around the game, we have a lot of instances that are comparable. Those are comparable communities. They face the same problems and have the same goals. They're very, they're a great variety. Each community is sovereign. They're customizable, and it's their administrator who decides how to customize them. I'm gonna open a window. I'm getting really hot in my car. Uh, and they're 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 heavily they're under heavy selection. There's finite resources, and they compete for players. I see chat, but I see the chats happening, but I, I can't see it without interfering with my own presentation, unfortunately. Um, if there's any questions, I do encourage you to just unmute and ask. And feel free to interrupt me as I go. So what we have, uh, another thing that's special about this game is because the server was released, it actually got reverse engineered by the fans. They, they, they decompiled the software, edited the software to install software hooks that made it customizable, and then re-released this pirate version of the server. What that did is create this giant ecosystem where administrators could, could modify the servers like crazy. They could install plugins that let them install a customized governance regime. In addition to that, they would actually set their intended community size if they wanted it to be four or wanted it to be 400 people. I can see that and look at how their governance choices are influenced by the server size. Um, this, uh, this shouldn't mean anything to you, these words, but these words are examples of the plugins that people can install. Uh, if I add tags to describe those plugins, now you can see what I mean by installing a governance style. You can install communication roles, law enforcement, violation monitoring. You can install private property rights or public property rights. Um, you can prevent bad behavior or fix bad behavior after it's happened. These are all two, and of course you can install social hierarchy and you can install market economies. So we see all of the variety of governance institutions available to people. And each of these is essentially a switch that a person can flip. Um, as a result of this, uh, you see communities surviving several months. That doesn't sound very long, but if, the, uh, if you, you pay for server space on the scale of a month and the median, uh, the median server uh, survival rate was nine weeks, so a little over two months, um, with some lasting much longer. So with all this setup, I wanna know what rules do people use when setting up governance on a social game uh, so what do people think will work? Because these are amateurs, they have no experience in governance. What do they think will work? What actually works? And how does what actually works depend on size? So what I did, I scanned Minecraft, uh, hundreds of thousands of servers every couple hours for two years. Um, I got uh, 300,000 servers in total, visited uh, 550 million times by 10 million unique players. Um, and then I did lots and lots of filtering. A lot of the beauty of big data, the power of big data, is the freedom to throw away 99.9% .9 of it, to isolate only on the, the sort of cleanest uh, subset of the data um, in a way that does not introduce bad selection bias. Uh, throw, the freedom to throw away 99.9% .9 of your data and still have uh, thousands of observations. So what we have here, this is my overall descriptives. Um, this is a histogram. It's a two-dimensional histogram. So you can think of these gray things as coming out at you to different heights. The darker gray, the higher it comes. What we have on the, on the horizontal axis is the intended community size. People on the right want to start a really small community. People on the left want to start a really big community in the left column. In the middle column, it's the darkest. Most people wanted to start a community that was about four to 16 people big. Um, that's, uh, that's a simultaneous maximum number of users. Now on the vertical axis, we have what I'm calling the core group. This is my measure of success of a community. Um, it's the number of people who came to your community instead of all the thousands of others they could have come to at least once a week for a month. So if your community was visited by zero people at least once a week for a month, it, it's a failure. If it was visited at least uh, by one person once a week for a month, that was probably you. So we're gonna also call that a failure. 
But if it was visited by two or four or, or, or 20 people at least once a week for a month, that's the size of your core group, your most committed users, and you're a success by my definition. Already you can see overwhelmingly about uh, two thirds of community were never visited by more than one person at least once a week for a month. So uh, most communities fail. My estimates around 95% of communities fail. Within this subset, it's closer to, to two thirds, um, which already is pretty dramatic. Um, and now we're going to attend to this diagonal. You'll see there's this weird triangle. There's no, all those white spaces exist because you can't have a core group of 100 on a server whose maximum size is four. So we have to uh, evaluate success relative to the goal of the user. But that's why we attend to this di upper diagonal. If you got only four users, well, you're a success if your goal was four, you're a failure if your goal was, goal was 400. I can pause here for questions, any questions? I think we're fine. Okay. Um, and how am I doing in time, Carlos? Uh, 20 more minutes. Fantastic. Okay, so, so now we're going to look, uh, these plugins, you can categorize them by what problem they solve, what, what resource challenge they solve, and how they try to solve that problem, what style of governance they use to solve a resource problem. So looking at what problem gets solved, what we see, I mean, you don't have to understand all these plots, just see where the blue pops out. And what you should see is between the, the management of virtual resources, management of physical resources, and management of bad behavior, overwhelming effort is put on managing bad behavior. That's the major resource challenge that has to be solved, at least in this system of online communities. Uh, and then zooming in on that, what we see, where's most of the blue? Most of the blue is to the left, which means, oh, this number, by the way, in every uh, cell, that's the median number of plugins that solve that problem within every bar of the histogram. You see that number going up, that's the more blue, more blue as communities get bigger. So bad behavior is a problem in every community, but it's more of a problem the bigger you get. Um, we also see, uh, looking on a, the other type of problem, this is a physical resource management, managing CPU and RAM. There's a lot less effort towards it, but whatever little effort you put towards it becomes much more important as you get bigger, also as you get more successful. This is a statistically significant result. This is a statistically significant result. The correlation with success actually didn't pop up on bad behavior. So we don't necessarily know that it's necessary. We just know that people do it more as they get bigger. In this case, we see it's correlated with success. This also doesn't necessarily mean that, that installing CPU management plugins causes success. It could mean having success causes more CPU management, um, but I uh, think that's less likely. So I'm doing some inter some causal interpretation, even though that's not even though this is just a, a, a regression. This is just a correlational analysis, not a causal analysis. I'm using sort of outside arguments, contextual arguments to get my causation rather than really rigorously getting it through a process of randomized experimentation. This is not the lab. I have to make assumptions. So I'm imposing the assumption that that um, uh, success is caused by uh, attention to physical resource management. Um, what about styles of problem solving? So in addition to the problems that have to be solved, we have the ways of solving those problems. I can improve the communication, peer-to-peer -peer communication. I can improve top-down communication. That's information. I can improve exchange mechanisms like installing markets, or I can uh, uh, increase the power of the administrator. Um, most governance plugins turned out to focus on the administrator and essentially increasing the list of actions they can perform relative to everybody else. And just like the most green, blue was on bad behavior, the most green is on the administrator. This means that most, the, the predominant governance style in these communities was empowering the administrator further. And zooming into that, um, within that, that, that panel, most of the green's on the right, meaning that most most focus on this governance style uh, got uh, increased the bigger your community got. Okay, so um, uh, 
I can also just look at the overall number of rules installed by a community. And what we see is that the more rules you installed, um, the bigger you tended to be and the more successful you tended to be. Additionally, we have this thing called institutional diversity. Um, there's variety in, in the ways people solve problems and there's variety in the problems people face. So um, this is essentially a measure of how ideological people were and the effect of being ideological. And what we see is the less ideological you were, the more you relied on a mix of governance solutions, the more likely your community was to be a success. Uh, no, I'm sorry, the, 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 I actually didn't get a success result. I sort of got a success result, but it's a little messy. And I'm sharing this result despite the messiness just to show that these things are messy. There's some evidence that the more you focus on a diverse array of governance styles, um, the more successful you were. Though there are other interpretations that are possible. So um, we essentially have, uh, no, I'll avoid that. Um, this, uh, so that's, that's the end of that. We have this um, study of, this ends up being about 5,000 communities and the evidence that governance intensity changes with community size. And that there's this heavy reliance on top-down leadership, which is really hard for me. I love democracy. Um, I love studying it. And so to have this result pop out quite cleanly um, was a challenge for me, but you know, I, had to, I had to go with the data. Um, one thing to keep in mind, this is an interesting aspect of it, because communities, communities can, people, users can keep their, um, their leaders accountable, not through voting, but by leaving. There's competition between communities, which amounts to a, a market for tyrants, a market for autocrats. And there's some theory in economics. I don't love this theory, but I think it's true that um, that when tyrants, dictatorships have to compete with each other for citizens, market pressure forces them to act as if they're benevolent. And so it's possible that the competition between communities uh, created pressure on um, these autocrats to act in the interests of their communities, that they're, and therefore that they're being benevolent despite this focus on, uh, on their own power. That's a conclusion from this work. I have quite a bit of other work in this area. This is this result. Additionally, uh, with, with citation, um, I, uh, working with engineers, we've actually built tools to help administrators better monitor the quality of participation on their server, essentially de democratizing game analytics. Um, we've done some within community uh, analysis with really fun big data sets. Um, I looked at, I have a, some work on cultural differences in, in World of Warcraft servers, supporting a theory, you can ask why are communities different? Why, is, why, why do different cultures exist in the world? Uh, there's different theories for this. Maybe environments differ. Maybe it's the people that differ. Um, the, what was supported by this work uh, is that, uh, and is that, uh, Sometimes random noise can drive emergent cultural differences. You have these servers, they all start out identical, um, but they evolve to have very different systems of social norms regulating bad behavior. And uh, the only plausible mechanism when, you're, when your environment is literally identical, bit for bit, when your community has very similar homogenous, relatively homogenous demographics, uh, young, mostly young males, um, then, then this last, uh, this rat last mechanism for the generation of cultural diversity, mirror noise, amplification of, of random deviation, uh, becomes more plausible. And then in progress, um, I have a lot of analyses of the rules people literally write and how those rules change over time as a proxy for what they learned. You have this idea of folk theory of physics in psychology. Folk theory of physics is that um, when I, when I, if I throw a ball on a curve, it'll fly through the air on a curve. We know that's false uh, if we study physics, but if you ask people on the street, this is what they think. Um, when, a, when, a, when a plane is flying and it drops a, a, a bomb, the bomb travel, should travel forward and land where the plane is by the time it hits. But in folk physics, 
the the ball the the bomb lands straight down. So in addition to folk physics, imagine folk theory of utopia, folk theory of governance, folk theory of, of collective action. What are the rules people think will work before they have any experience? And what do they learn as they learn to do well? According to evidence so far, the main sort of folk theory of utopia is that we don't need rules. The main thing people tend to learn as they govern these and other online communities longer is that you need more that that you need rules. And so we see over all communities, no matter how small they are, more rules over time to the extent they were successful. Um, these are all just exa examples Sorry, of, and that's it. I, I think now with, with coronavirus, there are plenty of examples of folk theory of <laughs> what we'll think, uh, what people think might work. And then let's say, maybe some of these could be classified with cognitive biases and things like that. That could be associated with what? It could be explained with cognitive biases. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, so I'm trying to avoid like the whole federal level. I'm really looking at small communities and yeah. their own interests because there's so many confounds of that when we're talking about, you know, the Mexican government, the US government response. Um, so I'm trying to avoid that and really look at, you know, book clubs for the because 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 that's a situation where it's the person running it has all the power. And so what they do is a reflection of what they think will work and nothing else. I mean, to some, to, as much as like as much as that's possible anyway. Um, uh, did that address your comment? Yeah, yeah. All right, any so other I, questions? Oh, Carlos, I'll let you, I'll let you steer. Uh, one more question while someone else prepares. There's, I, I see you're collaborating with several people in Zurich. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, the The first work was from my work at Disney, um, okay. which was in which was in Zurich. Weirdly. Yep. Uh, just before we came, uh, we were. Uh, well, I was uh, thinking about the limitations of democracy that are becoming more and more evident um, at the national and international level and also at the local level because you have conflicts between countries or between the federal and the states or between the mayors and the governors um, and many people have argued that democracy is uh, let's say already obsolete but the problem is that we don't have a better game in town so far. And it seems that it, it has failed because of complexity. So the societies are becoming more and more complex, uh, but the complexity of people in government or decision makers, even if you have, uh, let's say a group of people, let's say a council, it's much smaller compared to to the complexity of society. So because of Ashby's law of recursive variety, it's uh, you, you can be sure that they will make mistakes just simply because they don't have enough variety to consider all possible situations that societies will bump into. Uh, so I, I, Carlos, I, I disagree with you. I think democracy is uniquely adapt, uh, uh, suited uh, for management of complexity. But I think it has some, and I think it's failure modes are, um, are different. I think it's just hard to do well. I think culture and, and uh, civic training is an important part of keeping it working. Uh, but so what I want to attention to, rather than I'm right, you're right, um, yep. is, is, uh, is the fact that before online communities, in my opinion, this argument could never be a scientific argument. It would only be a philosophical <laughs> or ideological argument. But because we can study online communities, we can see the emergence of democracies. We can see the emergence of hierarchies. Uh, and we can uh, observe their success or failure 
thousands of times over, perform large scale yep. comparative studies and make these empirical questions. And that's really what I'm excited about. You, you're not yeah. seeing it in Minecraft, but um, a lot of open source software projects have very complex democracies they've built up. Um, yes. The World Wide Web Foundation, the Apache Software Foundation, uh, uh, the Debian operating system and a lot of others. And these are a great source of, of data. Yes, I I, uh, I I didn't finish the. Is that I, I don't mean to say that democracy failed. Therefore, we need to go back to authority. Uh, let's say to sure. some authoritarian, because that's even worse. Uh, if you have a small group of people making decisions, that will be even worse than democracies we have now. We need to go the other way. I I don't know whether to call it hyper democracy because I don't like the name. But let's say something where decision making can be distributed even more, and where you have also responsibility distributed even more, because until now, few people make decisions, and if they are right or wrong, everyone pays. And as you mentioned at the beginning, uh, if you, you need citizen participation, and now we have the technology to promote citizen par participation in a much stronger. Uh, level so yeah I, I i don't know how to call it whether hyper democracy or, or or not but uh to have let's say a single president making decisions that affect hundreds of millions of citizens seems to be obsolete i mean i, I think that's the part which is obsolete but not that let's say right now we don't have any other example where um let's say any other form of government where this is addressed properly so still democracy as we know it is the best game in town but i yeah, I, think yeah, we yeah should... I, I, I see i see what you're saying and i, I uh, i'm with you on the potential of technology um to make things better possibly even better at a faster rate than it makes them worse <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, in fact, I'm working on a project. If you want to visit um, metagov.org, it's a small collaboration I have. It's been one of the most rewarding collaborations in my entire life. Uh, um, we have a journalist, engineers, mathematicians, uh, and data scientists working together to build a sort of general governance API. This is mm -hmm. a very kind of, it's an early, early stages. I'm a little apprehensive to share it, but. Um, but uh, we're, we're, we're pursuing the dream despite all the, the doom uh, roles that technology also uh, uh, plays in uh, compounding the problems of democracy. Yeah, there, there are some questions in the chat. Uh, yes, yes, um, I've been addressing some of them sort of on the side. Um, the, the most recent question, do, do I create artificial users to interact with real users? Um, we, we actually wrote some grants to do this, but we were never able to get it off the ground. There's some potential for that. Um, I'd, still, I'd still love to do that kind of thing. Um, uh, it's just a matter of resources and getting the support. That's a great idea. Um, or when I say great idea, that's all, <laughs> that's, I, uh, I, uh, I think that's a really great idea. I really would love to do that. Um, there was a, I'll just say out loud some of the questions that were posed as people write other questions. I would love to get more questions. Um, there's a question, um, how did I get the data? Did I consume from an API? Um, the community built, when they reverse engineered the software, they built an API. What they wanted was, I told you about this market for communities. Um, the, the community built Minecraft serverless. You can go to minecraftserverless.org and what you'll see is a shopping list of communities you can shop around and visit between. Uh, the people who built those also built reporting to get live statistics from every server about who's there. Um, it was an amazing effort to build um, a community around this really weird model. And I was able to use only that to build my entire data set. Um, Justin, could you elaborate on this um, on this question about interdisciplinary scientific teams? Is that a research area of yours? I don't want to put you on the spot.
If you want to speak, you should unmute first. Uh, so, uh, I couldn't see inside communities. There's a lot of potential cons to analysis. I, you sort of do the best you can with the data you have. Um, nevertheless, I think that particular problem wouldn't be a major confound for all of the, for all of this analysis. Uh, uh, Carlos, thank you for all this time for questions. Yep. Well, th thank you very much, Seth, for, for your time. Um, well, I'll, I'll see you on Monday as well. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Uh, fantastic. Uh, once again, everybody, I apologize for being late. I tried to be resourceful. Um, I thought, honestly, uh, an EMP went off or something, the way all the electronics died at the same time five minutes before, uh, before this started. So thank you again for your patience, for having me. I'm really, really glad I was able to uh, find some Wi-Fi somewhere. Uh, I, I ended up on campus. Uh, I first tried Starbucks, <laughs> but uh, they they they, uh, they they turned off all their Wi-Fi during the pandemic. Um, thank you again for having me. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. I think my email is still up there. Here, I'll, I'll, I'll write it. And if you're interested in this work, um, absolutely reach out. Um, I absolutely love having people who are excited about this subject. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks again. Uh, I'm gonna I'll log off. Yep. Thank you, Seth. Thanks, everyone. Bye, Carlos. Great to see you. Yep. Bye.